similar to many uh, contemporary academic or practitioner working within the higher education environment, I wear many hats, some of which I find really challenging and not particularly enjoyable. But one of the roles that I inhabit with relish and love is directing the Southeast Archive of Seaside Photography, known commonly as Seas Photography. The archive is still very young, only established in 2012, and specialises, unsurprisingly given its name, on archiving those commercially taken images from the, south, uh, the UK's southeastern coastline from around 1850 onwards. My own research broadly considers the cultural, political and aesthetic dimensions to this practice of image making, image making at the water's edge. And today I'll be drawing upon these cultural, political and aesthetic strands as I consider specifically the role of the commercial female seaside photographer. Women were always there. In this turn of the century image here, we can see two typical male seaside photographers, the Margate photographers Van Hare and Thompson. They used these hand carts that we can see as mobile dark rooms. They were often referred to as dark carts, in which all the plates, uh, glass, and then later ferro, chemicals, and finishing frames would be stored. And the outside of the cart, you can just see it there, would be used as a shop front, displaying images to entice the beachgoer to have their own portrait taken. Such photographers were seen as part and parcel of the beach scene, working noisily, sometimes fiercely, alongside other itinerant sellers located on the beach. Such photographers were generally held in very low regard, and evidence for this can be seen in the frequently applied name of smudger and bodger, terms which of course provide explicit comic description, smudging and bodging the images being made. To date, I've only come across one, perhaps two, women photographers working on the seaside in the 19th century. Colin Harding, Audrey Linkman, and Paul Godfrey's excellent research in this, in this area all note that several women photographers were working as such. But to date, this has been actually very difficult to verify. But as in this image that we see, women were there in other capacities, assisting in calling people to the carts as a barker, uh, assisting in the finishing and framing, and often being the person to take the money to make the actual transaction. And this is a sort of image that they were producing. I like this as an, as an example, as it importantly provides visual evidence to counter the claim that these photographers were no more than bodgers and smudgers. When we examine this albeit very cheap seaside ephemera some 150 plus years after production, what we repeatedly see as here is competent and confident instantaneous image making or picture making. This photograph would have been taken, made, sold and framed in fewer than 15 minutes. It was a 19th century Polaroid equivalent. But note the odd crop, if I can just get this here, there, there. Under that mat is the rest of that child, uh, and there's actually another woman. But the standardised frame leads to a crude crop of, a, of an otherwise good photograph. Of course, the beach didn't remain the preserve of the commercial photographer for long. Soon after the turn of the century, as we know, the domestic camera would be brought onto the sands, and as we also know, the manufacturers of these cameras, the most prevalent being the Kodak with the box brownie, had always targeted the woman. The image here, again taken in Margate, proves interesting on a number of fronts. It's, for me, I spend a lot of time looking at these images, so uh, I find it wittily intertextual. The image that we see is a postcard, and it's got a company stamp on the back. So we know it was taken by a commercial seaside photographic company called Remington's. And Remington's only employed <coughs> male photographers. So interestingly, we have a male seaside photographer from Remington's taking a photograph of a young woman here, 
who is actually taking a photograph of a grouping here, which includes a man with his own box brownie there. Note, too, how the woman of a previous generation here um, looks curiously on, and how uh, the woman here with a blanket uh, looks towards the female photographer, whilst there are two men looking towards us, to the commercial male photographer. The crowd of other beachgoers that we can see looking at the boards, they are looking at postcards, probably of themselves, taken on the previous day, which they could then purchase from a nearby kiosk. And these would be postcards not dissimilar to uh, this one here. This is a slightly later one. Images such as these, each marked with a unique code, made purchasing and ordering easy and almost always were in the form of a postcard. Many such seaside photographs are characterised by props. In some seaside towns, these props were known as stunts um, and they included elaborate taxidermy, as we hear, see here with a tiger. We've also got examples of lions, zebras... And then there were other more child-friendly models being produced, such as the early Disney characters of Mickey Mouse and Donald Duck. And into the 1950s, we even see television tie-ins. So the UK television programme Muffin the Mule led to Muffin the Mule um, being on the beach in an attempt to lure the customer into having a cheap photographic keepsake made. These postcards are also, of course, a signifier of a good time, a happy time taking place. And sold in the form of a postcard, these could be posted home as joyful evidence as such. It's a great idea. And here, in this one, an example of a typical Ertzak donkey as prop or stunt. This, again, is taken in Margate, uh, the location of where the Turner Contemporary Gallery now stands. And, of course, as this is... That this commercial practice moves into the 1960s, we also see the use of colour. I'd like you to note the hidden mother here. Can you see her, her sandal <laughs> and her frock? The mother photographed simultaneously as seen and unseen is very common in these commercially taken seaside photographs of children. And I feel actually reminiscent of those early Victorian images of those rather spooky shrouded mother with her child. But this type of seaside image making, while seemingly prosaic and prosaic practice, drawing from the crude model of stack em high, sell em cheap, was big business. And a business that could only prove truly profitable if big, and thus necessarily highly systematised. What we see from as early as 1917, getting in quick, actually before the end of the First World War, what we see from 17 onwards is in order to be big, an increasingly structured model of uh, production model is imposed. No longer or rarely do we see the one man band photographer present. From 1917, this photography is photography as industry an industry which employs a labour force and is predicated on the industrial practice of the division of labour. In other words, the workforce would work on an individual aspect of production, and through this dividing of tasks across personnel, the production was significantly increased. The Margate-based commercial photographic company Sunbeam pro provides a typical and clear example of this, established in 1917. It rapidly gained an almost mon uh, monopolistic hold along the foreshore of not only Margate, but the surrounding seaside coast. A big enterprise, on certain days taking in excess of 40,000 of these images a day. And of interest to us today, as it employed many women, as seen here in the 1940s, just before the Second World War. But these women whilst within the photographic industry, were not photographers. Rather, they worked as administrators, secretaries and assistants supporting photographic production. And these women, slightly later, the late 1950s, early 1960s, again all employed by Sunbeam, but not as photographers, rather as kiosk girls, their term, not mine. They would sit in numerous small seaside kiosks along the coast, presenting and selling the images 
back to the sitters. And again here, slightly later in the 1960s, we can see the chap at the front here, Dave, he's a great, uh, uh, great chap, and the chap here are both photographers. They have the distinctive, by then 1960s sunbeam, half frame Olympus, uh, Olympus pen uh, with a faux flash. But they are shown with and supported by the two women here who would be working in the kiosk. And here, in the sunbeam factory itself, they had a factory, a highly mechanised factory floor, providing employment for women, but employment for women which was ring-fenced to, roll, to roles in image finishing and quality control, as seen again here in uh, the retouching and trimming. Note the annotation, girls at work. Of course, not my own writing. But whilst rare, women seaside photographers were present. Photography, photographers such as Patsy Rogers, seen here in the late 1960s. Patsy was the operator on Broadstairs Main Sands, called Viking Bay, and is represented here in a, a press shot for the Daily Mirror, shown as confident and connoting a modern independence, liberation even, made possible through her employment. But remember, Patsy is being photographed by a male press photographer and is thus posed and indeed directed. I'll come back to Patsy, but for now, here is a set of images not taken by her, but by another one of those somewhat rare 1960s female seaside photographers, this time taken in Brighton. And by a woman I think most of us or many of us in this room would know, but not, I suspect, know her as a photographer, and certainly not as a seaside photographer, indicative, perhaps, of these hidden female photographic histories. These images are typical of a type of seaside photography known very generally as walkies, photographs taken at pace and with some necessary, <coughs> excuse me, necessary photographic skill as people arrived at the seaside and walked or promenaded past the photographer's pitch. We can see the photographer had use of a, a stunt, a prop here, there, this strange donkey-esque construction, even a odder when we learn that it was apparently bright red. It would be utterly lost in this room, wouldn't it? We wouldn't be able to see it. Uh, and in interview, uh, she, the photographer, makes note of how she had a presence. She was youthful, she was attractive, she is still attractive, uh, but she was also shy, so would often have to grab at the image. But all the women photographers I have thus far interviewed were also repeatedly doing something beyond the task expected or wanted of them. As my research is just beginning to show, women photographers working along the coast were also making their own images. This set are from an exquisite, I think they're exquisite, an exquisite collection donated by an anonymous woman photographer who worked on the Isle of Thanet in the late 1950s and just into the 1960s. She repeatedly would use the equivalent of the 37th frame. She wasn't using 35 mil, but if we think about that final frame, to make a bonus image for her own pleasure. And when she could get a second camera out, she would use it to photograph her fellow male photographers and beach workers. Here we see the subjects revealing flirtation and playfulness. So we can see our lovely Ken here from 1960, and this chap showing his belly off and uh, hand standing alongside the ruby reflex there. The images she took are, are sweet. I don't mean that in a patronising way. I mean it in a heartfelt way. Sweet, tender, uh, engaging, differentiating, but evidently aspiring to differentiate themselves from the highly standardised commercial seaside walkies, uh, photographs and pictures. She's just three of them. This lovely example of a young co-worker balancing the somewhat bulky ruby reflex on his bicycle 
And, and I love how this woman here watches the female watcher. All of the women I interviewed made note of how they wanted to be photographers. But these women, operating during each summer season of the classical period of commercial seaside photography, the 1950s and 1960s, had to adhere by and large to the highly standardized model of production. If I return to the early set from Brighton, we can see this. Her work records the day trippers. We see a repeated composition. But this young woman also tells of what she refers to in, in a beautiful interview as the pictures I made in between. These are in essence her own work, her own voice coming through. The photographer is Anne Braeburn, known now to most of us here as a Anne Braeburn, the highly regarded, highly successful, creative director, photo historian, lecturer, and pho photography commissioner. But look at her own work, what she referred to as the in-between pictures. These over-the-railing shots, perhaps indicative of her then shyness, inherent shyness, demonstrating an unwillingness, perhaps even an inability at times to go down and be with the subjects. But through this distancing, she captures this amazing, very British moment of a family determined to stay on the beach despite the inclement weather <coughs> and resorting resourcefully to such comical wrappings. Isn't this hand uh, stretching the shroud to the pram, just glorious. And here, an unselfconscious intimacy, an extraordinarily beautiful photograph. Look at the second child weaved in here, uh, or the tension in uh, the, the hand gesture of the male figure. I recently had the pleasure of hearing the photographer Sheila Rock um, who's a, a non-native uh, British, she's, a, she's American, discussing her latest series, Tough and Tender, which is located around the British coast. She made note of how the coast creates so much of the psychology of what it is to be British. And I would argue that Anne's, Anne's images, there are many more uh, than, than I show here, of course. I'm just trying to whet your appetite for more. Uh, but how her pictures articulate this British psychology so, so potently. But what of these female photographic narrative histories? Here is Patsy again. For all the world, a confident 1960s woman delighting in revealing her body and relishing inhabiting the role of the seaside commercial photographer. Not quite so. In interview, she notes that she did enjoy the work. It suited her. But like the other female interviewees, she also commented on how, as the only woman photographer, she had to assert herself to hold the pitch. There were jealousies, and at times, the men would attempt to muscle in on a profitable patch of sand. She felt, and again common to a number of the other women that I've interviewed, that at times the men felt threatened by her ability, and perhaps at times their inability, to approach with utter ease beachgoers, particularly children and their families. But for me, what is most telling is that each of the women I interviewed said at that time they had wanted to be photographers. And by that, they meant a photographer beyond that of a summer season snapper. They aspired to be photographers. But whilst each of them clearly went on to have successful, worthwhile, interesting lives, the life they had sought as a photographer was never to be realized. Thank you.